Thanks, Darren. Thanks, Carlotta, for leading us this morning. Please open your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> if Romans is the greatest book in the Bible, Romans and Romans 8 is the greatest chapter in the Bible, well, today's passage then is the greatest section of the sacred text. Romans 8, uh, verses 28 through 39 represents the, the highest height of, of Christian theology. Uh, this is to the believer what the Olympics is to the, uh, the aspiring athlete. Uh, this is uh, the mu musician's Carnegie Hall. Uh, this is uh, the driver's Grand Prix. It's the best of the best of the best. Throughout this chapter... Paul has sought to reassure his audience, uh, recognizing that they have been uh, set free from the law of sin and death. The apostle wants his, uh, his readers to pursue a holy and sanctified life. In the first uh, half of this chapter, Paul reminded his readers that the Holy Spirit has been given to them uh, to assist them in this, this venture. But it's not just that the Holy Spirit is with them. He's in them. He has taken a permanent residence in their life to be the people that God has called them to be. He dwells in them, interceding with groanings too deep for words. Uh, he is the one who will help us on our spiritual journey. And yet now, as we come to the last 11 verses of the chapter, Paul is going to take us even further. Because up to this point, he has been focusing on the, the progress of the believer. Uh, their, their state in this, this present life. Their journey towards the goal. How to live a, a sanctified life on, on a daily basis. But now as we come to this last section of the text, Paul is going to, to focus our attention on the end. He wants his audience to understand that all those who have put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, they will cross the finish line. None will fall short. None will be left behind. All of them uh, will experience final salvation, that full sanctification we long for. And his rationale for this is remarkably simple. It's because God is for us. God is for us. He will see us through. Brothers and sisters, the, the greatest assurance you and I have concerning our sanctification, our, our salvation is this. God is for us. That's the message that Paul wants to convey in this last section of this remarkable chapter. So please stand with me as we read the text together. Romans chapter 8, we'll begin reading from verse 29 to the end of verse 39. This is the word of the Lord. And we know, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom, he also, these whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? 
God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather he who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is also interceding for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or, or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, what a privilege it is to study your word. Your word teaches us who you are. It reveals your plans and your purposes. It shows us the, the manner of life which we are to live. Father, we wouldn't know any of these things without it. And so what a wonderful blessing it is to come before you this morning and to be led into all truth by your Holy Spirit. We pray that he would do that today. Father, that we would not only understand the details of the text, but that we would be prompted to embrace it as our own, uh, to put it into practice in our lives so that we might be a people who give you all the honor and glory that you were due by living in a manner that is consistent with your revelation. We ask this all in the precious name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Please be seated. Allow me to begin with a little bit of a, a confession. You shouldn't usually begin a sermon that way, but I guess once you know the rules, you can break them every now and then. Um, but my confession is this. I, I have struggled with our sermon for this morning. Uh, not because uh, the text itself is opaque uh, or, or unknowable, uh, but because of the depth of what is placed before us this morning. Um, you know, when I was at school, you know, sit around with a, a number of the other guys. We're all, we're all pastors involved in, in regular preaching ministries. And, and just the normal thing that comes up in those kind of conversations is, you know, well, what are you preaching through? What are you dealing with in, in your, your congregation? How, how do things compare with my own? Uh, and so they would share what they were doing. I would share what, what I was doing. And uh, so, so they would ask me what, what I was were preaching through. So, well, we're preaching through the book of Romans. Oh, that's, that's, that's great. That's wonderful. Uh, as, and then I would add a little bit more to them and, and tell them, well, when I go, go back home, I'm, I'm going to be preaching through the last part of, of Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 28 uh, through the end of 39. And they would kind of sit back and, and look at me and wonder, okay, what's going on with this Atmore guy? Uh, has he bumped his head? Did he somehow jump out of the plane without a parachute? Because you're looking at a text that is so broad, so deep, so marvelous. That it would take you a lifetime to get through it. You know, one of the things I did tell them, though, was, yes, I understand the depth of the passage. At the same time, I, I am convinced that Paul's argument at this particular point in the epistle is actually very simple, exceedingly simple. Uh, and so our challenge today is, is to really to, to look at and, and see how that argument is developed through the text uh, without at least today uh, delving into the rabbit hole 
uh, following all those lines of theology that we should give attention to. And I trust that we will as we uh, progress in, in our journey of faith together. But Paul's main idea is this. His big idea that runs through, throughout the entire last section is that God is for us. Uh, this truth is revealed in the second line, the second sentence uh, of verse 31. And what we discover there is really that everything that transpires from verse 28 to 31 uh, has led him to make this abounding statement. And then everything that follows afterwards is simply another unfolding, an unpacking of this very principle. God is for us. He's, he's on our side. He's taken us to uh, be his own. And so he, he now acts as our redeemer, our deliverer, our friend. Uh, when Luther's successor, uh, Philip Melanchthon, sensed that he was nearing death, he asked his friends to, to place him on a bed and to carry him into his office, uh, the place where he was happiest. And then he asked uh, one of his pastoral assistants, a, a friend, uh, to read the epistle to the Romans to him. And when the man read Romans 8, verse 31, Melanchthon stopped him. He cried out saying, read those words again. His friend complied. He said, if God is for us, who can be against us? And murmuring almost in a state of exalted ecstasy, Melanchthon said, that's it. That's it. The Holy Spirit prompted the Apostle Paul to write these words, not only to, to comfort us at the time, or not only to comfort us at the time of our deaths, but to motivate us to live a life of holiness. He, he wants us to strive for godliness, knowing that there is nothing that can pre prevent us from completing this journey. Why? Because God is for us. Regardless of the, the obstacles or the opponents that we may encounter along that highway to heaven, God will see us through. He, he will help us to complete the journey. He'll bring us home. This is the believer's greatest assurance. It's the greatest assurance, that will, which will sustain us through life's most pressing struggle. It's the knowledge that God is for us. Well, Paul is going to present this great assurance really in three phases. He reveals the first phase in verses 28 through 30. There we discover that the believer's greatest assurance is reflected in God's sovereign purpose. Or we could say God's sovereign purposes. Look again at the text. It says, and we know. This is not something hidden in the pages of Scripture. Uh, this is something that is there, inscribed in every book. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. That statement is so familiar to us. that we may not, not even take the time to quote it in conversation. We'll simply state the reference. Uh, we know that a friend is, you know, they're, they're laboring under some sort of hardship. Uh, things are not going as planned. They, they've experienced some sort of reversal. And, and we simply tell them to take courage uh, by looking to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And, and I think that's good for us to do. That is appropriate. That's justifiable. But in doing so, I, I wonder if we understand the true intent of this particular text. Yes, God does work all things, good things, bad things, horrible things. He does work all things together for good to those who love God. But do you notice how the verse ends? Not only does it say that God works all things together for good to those who love God, but 
He also does so for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, Paul is not introducing two distinct classes or two dis- distinct groups of people in-, in saying this. Actually, one is paralleling the other. One is helping to explain the other. But in saying this, Paul is actually going further. He, he wants us to ask the question, okay, if God works all things together for good to those who love him, why does he do that? What, what actually is his purpose? What is his objective? in this? Well, Paul answers that question in verse 29. Really, what, there, what he does there is he shows us that God has a twofold purpose in working all things together for the good of those who love him. And his first purpose is that we might be conformed to the image of his son. He does not save us in order just to leave us to ourselves. We have been recreated in Christ Jesus so that we might walk in those good works that he has prepared or established beforehand that we might walk in them. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says, God the Father chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we might be holy and blameless before him in love. We're told in Colossians chapter 1 that that Christ has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order that you might, in order to present you before him, before God the Father, holy and blameless and beyond reproach. God works those things together for good, those bad things for your sanctification. Every moment of every day, every year, has been designed by an all-knowing God so that you might be conformed to the image of His Son. So that you might understand the sinfulness of sin. So that you might recognize that this world is not your home. So that you might recognize your need to depend on a God for every breath that you take. To recognize every, that every good gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no shifting or shadow. Everything is designed to move you in that direction. That's his first purpose. But it goes beyond that. Not only is God's purpose to conform us to the image of his son, but God's purpose in calling us to himself is that Christ might be the firstborn among many brethren. God's purpose in sending his son was to provide his son with offspring. Uh, Turn back quickly in your Bibles to uh, Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53, look at verses 10 and 11. Isaiah 53, again, one of these passages that we know that we can quote so often. But the Lord, God the Father, verse 10, was pleased to crush him, putting him, his son, to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he, his son, his suffering servant, what he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it, what? His offspring and be satisfied. Jesus, the Lord Jesus himself, recognized that the church was the the love gift of God the Father to God the Son. So that's the second purpose of of God in calling us to himself. 
Well, if these are the, the very purposes for which we are called, how do we ensure that this will actually take place? What is the mechanism that God has designed to guarantee this, these outcomes? Well, that's actually given to us in the text itself. Look at verse 29 and 30. If we dropped out these qualifying statements, notice how the passage reads. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Those whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Theologians call this the, the golden chain of redemption. Because every link in this chain has been ordained by a sovereign God been welded together so that they form an indestructible bond. What is said of one link in the chain it, it applies to each other. It, it, it cannot be broken. It cannot be separated out. Who is it that's predestined? It's those who are foreknown by God. Uh, who are those who are called? It's the very same ones who were predestined, the very same ones who were foreknown. Uh, they all fit together. Uh, all of this has taken place over God, uh, under God's sovereign direction. He is the one who is acting in each and every case here. We're told that those who are conformed to the image of God are those who have been called according to the foreknowledge of God. What does that mean? Some people believe that it's simply God looking down the corridors of time and seeing how someone will respond under a certain circumstance, that, that if certain things just kind of align rightly, they, they will put their faith and trust in, in, in God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is not what the text is saying. I, I know that for a couple of reasons. Because that if that is what the text is saying, the the verb that is used here would need to be in the passive tense or in what they call the aorist tense. The passive tense is would recognize that God is having something done to him. He is receiving knowledge. The aorist tense is simply just, it looks at things just as a blanket whole. It doesn't really give you one sense or, or the other. But what's being used here is an active sense. God is actively foreknowing. You cannot actively foreknow something that is happen, happening out there uh, somewhere else uh, as if looking down the corridors of time. No, that is knowledge you receive. But this is active. Not only that, but it, the word itself is an intensive w form of the word to know. And as we look in, in the scriptures, uh, both the New Testament and, and in the Hebrew text, the, the know it. To know something is to, to have a fond affection for something, to, to place a, a special interest on someone. So in Genesis chapter 4, we read that Cain knew his wife, and they had offspring. Are we to think that he didn't know who his wife was? That's, that's not the case at all. Abram knew Sarai. Uh, we're told in the book of Amos that... Uh, it's, it's translated this way, of all the families of the earth, I have chosen you, Israel. But that's actually not the word that's used there. It's the word known. It always expresses this idea of having a special interest in someone. Uh, taking them and placing them before your own mind. Marking them out as one who is a recipient of your love and your affection, your care and your concern. It is these people whom God has foreknown that he then predestines. Uh, he charts out their course of life before time uh, ever came into being. Every step, every moment, every occurrence, planned in the counsel of God. These individuals, according to God's plan, are called by him. Sometimes this word call can refer to an external call. 
uh, as if Paul on the, the or Peter on the day of Pentecost uh, calls out to the cr- crowd and he, and he urges them to uh, to repent and to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. That is a general call, just a, a putting it out there. But Scripture also speaks of an inward call. It, it's the means by which God, through the Holy Spirit, uh, takes the spoken word and draws that individual to saving faith in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, in fact, what he must do, because all of us, by nature, are rebel sinners. All of us, by nature, we do respond to God, but never in a favorable way. Our response is always one of rejection, always one of rebellion, always one of turning our back on our Creator. And so God must effectively call us and bring us to Himself. Well, those individuals who are called then are justified. They are declared uh, righteous in the sight of God, not on the basis of what they have done, but on the basis of what Christ has done on their behalf. Christ was clothed with their sin, but we are clothed with his righteousness. And then the last link in this chain is that of glorification. Uh, We might call this uh, final sanctification, uh, salvation. This is the point where we actually become like Christ. Not divine, but sinless. Where the sin nature is done away with fully and finally forever. It's a time where we will love our Savior as we ought. In the fullness of what that means. The interesting thing here is that this glorification is is written in the present tense. It's not that we will be glorified. It's actually written in the past tense. It's that we have been glorified. The idea being here that it is so certain, it's so solid that it cannot be disputed. So we might as well put it in the past tense as well. God is for us. We see that in his sovereign purposes. The purpose by which we come become like his son, uh, the purpose in which we become first uh, he becomes the firstborn amongst many brethren. And in order to solidify that, to make it absolutely certain, God has established this unbreakable chain. This this, pres- this this process that cannot be disrupted or thwarted. So having presented God's sovereign purpose, Paul then moves on to the second phase of his argument in verses 31 to 34. This time he shows us that the believer's greatest assurance is reflected in the Son's provision. It's reflected in the Son's provision. He begins once again with that central thesis. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Uh, The latter phrase then expresses the idea of utter frustration, that if God is for us, which he is, then who is able to, to thwart his sovereign plans and purposes for his children? Who is able to take their stand against us? Who will triumph over the God who sits enthroned over the circle of the earth? Over the one who stretches out the heavens like a curtain? Who reduces rulers to nothing? Who, who makes judges the judges of the earth meaningless? Our God, the one who created the stars, who leads them forth by the number, who knows every, their every name, He merely blows on the earth's best and brightest, and we're told that they wither before him. As if they were never there to begin with. None can thwart 
the designs of him who is all-knowing and all-powerful. But notice how Paul develops his argument in this section. He points to God's provision of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in doing so, he makes a twofold argument, one that is both logical and legal in nature. His logical argument begins in verse 32. Paul says, If God the Father did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Imagine that you were invited to dine at one of the country's finest restaurants. We're not talking about McDonald's here. Uh, I mean, we're talking about a two or three Michelin star enterprise. Imagine that the owner spares no expense in bringing you to his restaurant. He, he charters a private jet. Uh, he doles out the cash for a, a long black limousine. Outside his restaurant, you notice that the, the table, it, it's set for royalty. The napkins are intricately folded. You never know how they make the swan out of a, a napkin. The, the stemware, it's crystal. It glistens alongside those gilded plates and that, uh, those polished uh, utensils. Surveying the scene, you, you notice the delicacies that have already been placed on the table before you. There's filet mignon. It's, it's smothered with a, a generous, glossy helping of Bernays sauce. There's lobster and shrimp and, and rack of lamb. And then to the side, you spy the dessert table. It's stacked with cakes and, and, and trifles and, and chocolate bonbons that would make the most seasoned gourmand cry out, ooh la la. And yet as the sights and, and the smells continue to assault your senses, I mean, you are salivating at this point in time. As you reach out and, and take hold of the door to the restaurant and you give it a pull, you recognize that the door is locked. I mean, it's absurd. The, the, the owner has gone to great expense to, to bring you to this particular place at this particular time. Uh, his, his staff ha have labored hours, perhaps even days, to, to put this sumptuous feast together. It's ludicrous. I mean, it's crazy time to think that a locked door is going to prevent you from enjoying this magnificent meal. It is just not reasonable to go through all this trouble only to have one's efforts thwarted by some insignificant concern, some insignificant process. Well, that's the point that Paul is making here. God did not send his son to die on Calvary's cross to redeem rebel sinners, only to have that work threatened by lesser concerns. No, he will see it through. Having spent so much already, God the Father will give us freely of all things to ensure that, he is, that we will attain the purpose for which we are called. If that means that the sun in the sky is destroyed, it'll be destroyed. If the earth needs to be turned, or the, the, the moon needs to be turned into dust, it'll be turned into dust. He will do everything in his infinite power. He will expend his limitless resources to guarantee that we reach our final destination. Let me suggest something else. It's more than that. Because that's only one side of the equation. The Father ensures our success, our full and final sanctification, so that not one drop, not one drop 
of Christ's sacrifice is wasted. So that not one soul that he died to redeem is lost. His sacrifice is too valuable for that to happen. So he will do everything in his power to guard this precious investment. That's the logical argument. Now Paul turns to the legal one in verses 33 and 34. The text reads like this. It says, who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. There's a hint of sarcasm here. You see, Satan is literally the accuser of the brethren. His name actually means that. He's the accuser. He's the adversary. In the same way he accused Job in the courtroom of heaven in Job chapter, Job chapter chapters 1 and 2, the uh, same way he tries to indict uh, Joshua the high priest in Zechariah chapter uh, 3. What we discover in Scripture is that Satan seeks to rob us of our salvation by leveling accusations against us before God Almighty. And yet this is a fool's errand. This is destined to fail each and every time. You see, our good friend R.C. Sproul believes that Paul is mocking Satan at this point. And he's doing, by extension, every other accuser. Why? Because they are seeking to make their case before the God who does what? Who justifies. This God knows our state. This supreme justice, the one who sits, who presides over the high court of heaven, he is not ignorant concerning the facts of the matter. He knows who we are. He knows the sin that lies within. That is precisely why he sent his son. The son who died. The son who rose again. The son who is now seated at his right hand, interceding for us. It's as if Paul is, or, or God would say to Satan at this, at, this, at this point, don't you get it? The case has already been tried. The judgment has already been given. The penalty has already been paid. Legally, it's done. There's no room for motions to be filed. There's no more appeals to be heard. No higher court to be consulted. The matter has been settled now and forever. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God is for us. Our judge will never recant his decision. No one else has the authority to force him to do so. That great assurance that we have been given, this great assurance that we have been given is, is revealed in God's sovereign purposes. It's demonstrated in the provision of his son. Now as we arrive at the last section of our passage, we'll note that it is reflected in the believer's steadfast perseverance. The fact that some, nothing can ever separate us from the end goal. Believers will make it to the end. Of that, there is no doubt. It, this section begins at verse 35. Uh, let's look at the text together. Verse 35, who will separate us 
from the love of, of Christ? Will tribulations or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword Paul says, just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Now, at this point, Paul is actually quoting uh, Psalm chapter 44, verse 22. He does so to demonstrate that there will always be opposition to God and to his work. There will always be opposition to those who put their faith in him and his provision. We are not exempt from those harsh realities. So what must we do? We must acknowledge them. We must embrace them as a normal part of the Christian life. And perhaps that's why the Holy Spirit prompted Paul to include this section, this reference in his epistle. Because in fact, he's, he's preparing them for difficult days ahead. Consider the words of John MacArthur. This is what he writes. He says, Paul probably wrote this letter to Rome during a winter in Corinth. And it is not likely that either Paul or the Roman believers recognized how short the time would be before they would stand in need of the apostles' comforting words in this passage. It would not be many years before they would face fierce persecution from a pagan government and a people that now tolerated them with indifference. It would not be long before the blood of those to whom this epistle is addressed would soak the sands of the Roman amphitheaters. Some would be mauled by wild beasts. Some would be slain by ruthless gladiators. Others would be used as human torches to light Nero's garden parties. And yet in spite of all these things, notice what Paul writes, how he responds. He says, but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer. Uh, the text is really saying we're more than conquerors. Uh, we're super conquerors. We're, uh, we conquer by a wide margin with, with room to spare. And we do so through him who loved us. Paul says, for I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing, just in case I've missed something, Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. John Chrysostom was one of the greatest preachers of the fourth century. Before he would become the Archbishop of Constantinople, uh, he was known as the golden mouthed preacher simply because he taught the, the Word of God with an uncommon clarity. People could simply understand him, common folk. It didn't matter if he was addressing the, you know, the upper crust of society or, or a, a lowly maid, uh, a slave who, who just worked in the field day in or day out. He explained the text accurately in a manner that could be understood. But he was also known as a fearless communicator. Uh, one who railed against the abuses of his day. Uh, one, who, one who spoke out against the lavish extremes of the, the aristocrats and the socialites. This, of course, did not earn him any favor with the local authorities. So eventually he was summoned to appear before the Roman emperor and he was threatened with banishment. He was told that he would be thrown, he would be thrown into exile if he did not recant. 
He would be banished if he remained a Christian. His response really reflects that of the Apostle Paul here. Listen to the record of that encounter. Chrysostom begins this way. He says, Thou canst not banish me from this world. It is my Father's house. But I will slay thee, said the emperor. (laughs) Nay, thou canst not, said the noble champion of the faith, for my life is hidden in Christ with God. I will take away your treasures. How? For my treasure is in heaven and my heart is there also. But I will drive thee away from man, and thou shalt have no friend left. Nay, thou canst not. For I have a friend in heaven. From whom thou canst not separate me. I defy thee. For there is nothing that thou canst do to hurt me. Brothers and sisters, in God's economy, there is nothing lost that will not be recovered. Nothing spent that will not be redoubled or rewarded a hundred times over. God is for us. None will be able to stand against us. None will be able to thwart his sovereign purpose, his sovereign plan. No one will be able to separate us from his love or from the love of his son. We will all make it home. What then shall we say to these things if we go back to that question? We say thank you. We express our gratitude, our thanksgiving to God. Recognizing that his foreknowledge, his predetermination, his calling of us was not based on any human merit. We'll actually see that in Romans chapter 9. That he chooses us before the beginning of time, before we have, before, specifically before we have done anything either good or bad. It is all an act of mercy, all an act of grace on his, on his behalf. And so we thank him. We praise him. But going back to that question, let's reword it a, l- a little bit. Uh, not simply what shall we say to these things, but what should we do in response to these things? What should we do in response? Beyond words, we turn it into deeds. What it means is that we pursue a sanctified life. We live a a life of radical commitment to the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, We live that life in the midst of a secular workforce, uh, recognizing that if that means we lose our job, we lose face in, in the sight of unbelieving coworkers, it matters not because our position our standing before God is secure. They cannot take anything away from us that God has not ordained to give us. Not only that, but our our reward will be greater still. We live a life of radical commitment to him, knowing that we will cross that finish line. That is the response of the believer. If you have not trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning, your response needs to be much different. Because the reality is that you do not have that confidence. You have not been given that great assurance. Scripture tells us that you are by nature a a child of wrath. Destined for a a lost eternity in, in the pit of hell. And yet Christ calls you to come. To come to him. To put your faith and trust in him. To believe that he has died 
on your behalf on Calvary's cross, that your sins can be atoned for, that you can have eternal life in his name. But you cannot depend on yourself. You must throw yourself at his mercy. You must avail yourself of his grace. And as you do so, you will have this great and grand, glorious assurance as well. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this tremendous assurance that you are for us. That you love us. That you're seeking our best. Uh, that you will do everything within your power to bring your children home, uh, to honor the sacrifice of your son, uh, to, to exalt him as the firstborn amongst many brethren. Father, we long for that day. A day when we stand before you. A day when we will actually be like Christ. Until that time, we ask that you would help us to be faithful followers. That you would help us to see the cares and concerns of this world in new light. To recognize that they are ephemeral things, temporary things, that they will not last Help us to give ourselves to the work to which you have called us. To share this gospel with those around us. To seek to be used of you to draw them to saving faith in, in, in your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. To, to live a life that is pleasing in your sight, recognizing that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. It will never be looked over or miscalculated, or forgotten. Help us to do that so that you might receive all the honor and glory that you are due. We pray this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen.